welcome back to the Hackaday Remoticon, everyone. Thank you for uh, sticking around with us all day. I'm really excited to be introducing our final speaker of the event. Uh, there are certainly distinctions between people working in software, electronics, and mechanical engineering fields, but I think the productivity of your average engineer has risen so much that it's blurred these lines. And it means that every one of us needs to have cross-disciplinary skills. And if you're like me and you wanna level up your mechanical engineering skills, we are in for a treat with our next keynote speaker. Jeremy Fielding has been chasing down an incredible range of skills useful to anyone building hardware. I first took note of his YouTube channel early last year when he was turning a relatively inexpensive yet beefy electric motor into a dynamometer to characterize other motors. But of late, I think the buzz on everyone's mind is this incredible industrial arm that he has built completely from scratch. Uh, Jeremy calls himself a contraption engineer, and I'm excited to hear more about how you do the wonderful things that you do. It is my pleasure to introduce Hackaday Remoticon keynote speaker, Jeremy Fielding. Well, good evening, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. I am going to uh, go ahead and turn on the screen sharing. There we go. Okay, so as you can see, um, or as you know by this point, the topic is building hardware that moves. And I felt it was fitting probably to give you a little bit of a background about myself first. And that is, I basically, I design machines that do stuff. And um, yeah, I got a timer over here that I want to get going. So that could be anything from science experiments all the way up to full-on industrial equipment. Uh, most of that stuff is not stuff I could share with you here, but there's one project that I have just to give you a sense of scale. And that's this project. I did this about three years ago, and that's me to give you a sense of how big this pit is. But essentially, the customer was trying to move all of this sand to another location, and they were driving it with trucks uh, quite a long distance. So my chief engineer said, what if we pumped it into this tank, turned it into a slurry, and then sucked it out like a milkshake, pumping it down the line, then we can dry it out when we get it to where we're going. So long story short, that's what all this is that you see in the background. Go back one, there we go. All of this equipment is designed to turn this dirt into a milkshake, pump it through this pumping line here, and then send it on down the line to where it needs to go saved a whole bunch of money and gas and all that good stuff. But the idea is that this is the kind of stuff that I do. I love making things. And when I'm not doing it at work, I'm also doing it at home. So that's where the YouTube channel comes in. So I put my home page up here, not because I wanted to show you my page, you could find that, but I wanna show you this because all throughout this talk, I'm gonna be talking about a lot of things that I've covered on my YouTube channel before. And on everybody's YouTube page, there is a, I, a place right here where you can search within a YouTube channel. So I'm gonna strongly encourage that you go to here. And if you have any follow-up questions where you want more details about the things I'm gonna be covering, you'll very likely be able to find a whole video on that very topic. So that's where you can go, go to my homepage, click on the little search icon, and then all of the videos will come up related to your search. All right. So this is the latest project from my YouTube channel. It's a full-size industrial robot arm that I built myself. And uh, this is definitely by far the most difficult project I've ever done in my workshop. Uh, maybe except the one that I just started, uh, we'll see. But this one is pretty hard. So what makes this so challenging is not just the mechanical build, which is where I feel the strongest. It's all of the electrical design. I mean, this part of the project in my opinion, was almost as complicated as the mechanical design. And so I invested a lot of time in uh, working out the relay logic, working out all the servo controllers, their settings, a lot of energy and time went into a project like this. And I think it shows on my YouTube channel. So I frequently get this question, where do I start? And that's how I decided on the topic today, because people see these projects and they say, man, I want to do something like that, but they don't really know where to get started. And I'm hoping to close that gap just a little bit today by talking to you about how to build things yourself, your own ideas, your own designs. And I think if you are an engineer, you have a lot of tools at your disposal. I mean, we're talking about everything from 
grabbing your calculator, putting in formulas and doing the math to figure out if your structure is strong enough. I've got CAD tools available to me. I've got reference books. I can go over here and say, hey, you know, I can look through a list and find if the beam is going to be strong enough and things like that. But if you're making things at home, not only do you not have those tools, um, for the most part, you don't need them. And what I suggest is that you make prototypes. For me, one of my favorite prototypes is this. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see the very first video is this guy. When I started my YouTube channel, I had no engineering training at all. So I was literally just making it up as I go. And I didn't know anything about linkages, but you can see this guy has linkages on it. Again, a project that moves. Uh, what inspired this idea was I had a really tiny workshop and I wanted to figure out how do I squeeze more tools into that little tiny space. And I came up with this idea. I said, man, it would be great if I could have a workbench where I'd have my miter saw, uh, not miter saw, my um, router on one side, and then you could flip it over inside the same space and have a little bench top bandsaw on top. So I made this thing out of wood and I was, I even made one out of cardboard as well, which is what this clip is that you see on your screen. This is where I figured out how long the linkages need to be. I knew nothing about calculating linkages. I was just sticking pins in the cardboard and figuring it out. And so this is the first thing you need to do before you spend a lot of time just telling yourself, I don't know how to do this. Grab some cardboard, grab some pieces of wood and just start making shapes and trying to figure it out. You'll be surprised how quickly you can get to a working prototype if you just grab some cheap materials and go for it. Uh, over here is the only picture I could find of the actual build. This is right before I put the bandsaw on it. But I used that thing for about three years before I uh, upgraded the bench and started doing some different stuff. So here is another project uh, that was a similar idea. I built this a few months later. I wanted to build my kids a giant toy box, which is what you're looking at. But my kids were really small at the time. And I was concerned about that heavy wooden lid you know, it's falling on little baby fingers. So I came up with this linkage idea, which again, linkages were already on the brain. Using this linkage allowed me to keep the lid very low. So when they pull on it, it comes down and it stays only a couple inches above the surface as it comes down and closes the toy box. Again, they played with this for a long time. They got a lot of good use out of this. And I did the same thing with this. I just had one two-dimensional uh, piece of cardboard I drew out these linkages on the side and I worked it until I could close the lid in cardboard. And then I actually built the structure. Later on, I went back and added this little rod. Let me see if I can turn on my laser pointer. Here we go. Later on, I came back and added this as a support because there was a position where it would go too far and lock down at the bottom. So this was sort of an iteration of the design. I put that little lid on there and then that solved that problem. It never locked in the back and the kids could open and close it very easily. So let's talk about designing a little bit. First thing you wanna do is sketch out your idea. Uh, I don't recommend that you go right out to your tools and start making stuff. That is a recipe for disaster. Uh, in my opinion, you should at least draw out a scale model. I always use graphing paper. In fact, I keep some right here on my desk. And then I've also got my iPad, which is a little bit further away from me. And that's what this drawing is. So if you get my laser pointer back, here we go. This is a drawing I did for a parabolic mirror. This is a science project that I was, I had to design a rig that would allow us to very carefully position a really heavy parabolic mirror. And if you look at the top, I just started sketching. I didn't erase anything. I didn't scratch anything through. I just drew the first iteration and moved over, drew the second and kept going as I was thinking through how I would hold on to the mirror, how I would mount it, how I would tilt it. And the you can just sort of see the evolution of the design. And I ended up with a square tube column and some adjustable pieces that would allow me to slide this thing up and down. But the thing that I want you to take away from this is it can start very crude, right? Like these are ugly drawings. They're not to scale. They don't need to be. At this point, you're just trying to figure out kind of what the shape is going to be. Once you have that, then I strongly recommend that you start making it to scale. Uh, 
So on your graph paper, you can make each block worth a millimeter or a centimeter or a foot, whatever units you want to use, and then draw it out to scale. From there, you're going to step up and actually start cutting out some pieces. And again, I strongly recommend you make some kind of prototype either out of wood, which is really easy to make. Wood is easy to cut with very cheap tools. It doesn't cost you very much to get into woodworking. But even cheaper than this is cardboard and a box cutter, and you can be right on top of it. And oh, look at that. I left a note on the screen for me. Cheap and fast materials, cardboard and wood. Another common mistake that I see beginners make is they make holes size on size. And what that means is if they expect to put a quarter inch pin inside of a hole, they make the hole a quarter inch. And again, that's another recipe for problems. Your holes should always have some clearance around it. Now, there's a book you can get called <laughs> The Machinery Handbook, and it goes into great detail down to thousands of an inch how big that hole should be to get the kind of fit that you want. But again, if you're not an engineer, you don't need to do that. All you need to do is oversize, oversize it a little bit. I usually just, if I don't really care what the number is and don't care how loose it is, I just go the next drill size up, plunge the hole and keep working. And that's a decent rule of thumb to get started with. As you get further along or your, your precision needs to be higher, then you might need to start thinking in thousands of an inch to make sure that you get the right kind of fit. All right, doing pretty good here. Uh, know your raw material dimensions. Uh, I bring this up because if you're new to uh, woodworking or even metalworking, uh, the raw material that you get, is not always the nominal dimension that it comes in. So if you go to your big box you know, store that's selling your lumber, you can walk up and it says two by four, but it's not actually two inches by four inches. It's one and a half inches by three and a half inches. And so when you're designing your parts, you need to know that. Uh, as the part gets bigger, the dimensions actually change more. So a two by 10 is I think a nine and a quarter inches instead, or it might actually be nine and an eighth. Somebody will correct me on that. But the key is, it's not nine and a half. That number is getting smaller and smaller as the wood gets bigger. And um, you just wanna be aware of what the actual dimension is so that you know what, how much raw material you're working with. And then now that you know how much raw material you're working with, you gotta be sure you have enough material to actually cut out your parts and that you have enough raw material to actually work the piece. So this is more important with metalworking than woodworking, but if you are machining a piece, for example, you got to have enough not only to cut your part out, but you also need to have enough material left that you can hold it in your vise, or if it's in, uh, if it's in the jaws, whatever it is, you need to make sure that you've got enough material to actually hold on to the part while you're machining it. And then you can run into similar problems with woodworking, but not quite as often as machining. Again, one of those things to be thinking about during the design process, you don't want to think about this when you're already cutting out your pieces. This one is pretty important. It's a surprising problem. And that is when you're designing it, you have to make sure that you can actually assemble it. And here's what I mean. Like if you're using CAD software, for example, you can put fasteners anywhere. It doesn't really matter if there's actually room to put the fastener in and take it out or if there's room to put a tool on top of the fastener and then tighten it down. So all of these are things that you wanna think about. If you're putting nails in your piece, do you actually have room to swing a hammer and hit the nail? These are things that are really easy to overlook when you are a beginner and just getting started at this. So it's something you wanna think about as you're designing it, can I assemble this? All of the fasteners, if I wanna glue this thing up, if it's a woodworking project, can I actually put clamps on it to hold it together while the glue is drying? Thinking about the assembly process while you're designing it will save you a lot of headaches along the way. And then don't forget the fasteners. But here, I'm not just talking about uh, what I just mentioned earlier about how the fasteners will fit, but just thinking about them, the whole process of the fastener, whether you're gonna have a nut on the back or not, do you need threads in there? how long the fastener needs to be, and whether that full length fastener will still get in and out of place 
if you need to disassemble it. So just thinking through the fasteners as a separate thing from the whole assembly will also save you a lot of trouble. All right, a few more here. Check whether it moves freely. So this goes back to my prototyping. When I first built this, I noticed that it would actually stick. So uh, the first iteration of this, I couldn't quite get it to tilt. Again, I was new to designing stuff like this. So I actually loosened up the holes and I found that that gave me just a little bit more room to allow it to flip over. In the final design, I ended up adding slots there, which allowed it to slide back and forth during the movement. And that gave me just enough play to make it work fluently. So these are things you want to think about, whether you need slots or not, whether, you, whether your structure actually has enough room to move. And then also, well, while we're talking about prototypes, you want to think about how it's going to withstand the load. So I would take the time to kind of push on the different sides of it, uh, where the weight would be, and just thinking through what your loads will actually be. And I think we covered those two. All right. So moving on, shapes. Now, I'm showing you an I-beam because this really represents like the ideal material and shape, right? It's the perfect marriage of having a good shape as well as the right material. Steel is extremely strong and I-beams optimize the shape of the material. That's why you see them used so much in order to withstand bending. But there's another element that I want you to think about here. So I'm going to give you a second to look at this. And which one of these would withstand the load better? Would it be this I beam or this I beam? I'm expecting this to be a fairly easy question. It's the follow up question that makes this a little bit more surprising. So hopefully you selected this one, right? This is what an I beam is designed for. It's got the maximum amount of material lined up with the load. But here's where people make mistakes, including engineers sometimes, is your load is not always gravity. You can have loads on the side. So let's use a ruler, for example. If this ruler was my I-beam and I have it in this orientation, and then there's a load on it, you can see even this piece of steel starts to bow way more than I wanted to. And hopefully you wouldn't want it to bow this much either unless you were designing a, uh, a diving board. But if you rotate it this way, there's no, no bending at all, right? And it's imperceptible, the amount of bending. And that's because the load is in line with the maximum amount of material. But here's the part I want you to think about. Sometimes the load is not gravity. Sometimes the load is in the other direction. So if I had a load going like this, I've got the same problem, right? Rotate it this way, it's still bending. So this happens when you are designing something that say it was overhung and you had a motor here with a belt drive, then the belt actually creates a pulling force in this direction and therefore your beam will bend. So under those applications, it might actually be better if it was designed this way to resist the load. So the key message that I want you to take away from this is think about the orientation of the load and then that'll help you design a better structure. That way you don't make all your eye beams like this when the load is actually in this direction is what I'm getting at. Probably a really good example that we can all think of. If you've ever assembled a bookshelf, then you know you can put the framing together first. And if you put something on it, it's probably fine. But if you lean on the side, it tips right over if you don't have the back on it, right? Because that back plate is what gives you stiffness in that uh, lateral direction. Without that back plate in place, then your whole bookcase will collapse. And it's the same with all of your designs. If you design it in such a way that it can handle whatever load you put on it, whether you're leaning on your bookcase from the side or stacking heavy books on the top, it can stand up to the load in both applications. All right. All right, so I'm not gonna dwell on this one too much, but this one is just a fun one, I think, both for engineers as well as those who aren't engineers. So I want to kind of differentiate between strength, strength and stiffness. A lot of people think because they normally come together, we kind of think of them as being the same, but they're not. Like uh, I'm using breadsticks here the, uh, because they're, I think they represent stiffness in a way that 
makes a lot of sense to us. Even if you don't eat breadsticks, you've broken one before and you know they're extremely stiff, but also very brittle. They have almost no strength. And rubber bands are kind of the opposite. They are not stiff at all. They stretch with even the slightest load, but they can be really strong. I mean, the thicker the rubber band, obviously, the stronger it is. So we have materials where we can see examples of high strength and low stiffness and vice versa, high stiffness and low strength. Now, what does that mean to you? Well, different materials have different combinations of strength and stiffness. And so you wanna think about that whenever you are designing your structure. If you're making like a fancy coffee table, let's say with a glass top, well, that glass, it has kind of medium strength, but it's extremely stiff and brittle. So if you put that glass top on a wooden table that's not designed to be stiff, then any flexing of the table can break your glass. So obviously we don't want that, right? Ideally, you want your materials to have similar strength and stiffness. But you can design your system in such a way that it can handle that. Remember what I said earlier about if you orient the material in the direction of the load, it'll be stiffer. You could do the same thing with your wooden coffee table. If you orient the legs in such a way that they're stiff in the way that they would bend under the glass, then you can keep that from causing any damage to your, uh, to your glass table. And then there's one more that I find really interesting, and that's the difference between steel and high strength steel. This is, an, this is a problem that engineers, or this is an issue that engineers can mess up. High strength steel and regular steel have exactly the same modulus of elasticity. Now, I just threw a big word at you. All that means is they have exactly the same amount of flexibility. So if you have a steel structure like this with a load on it, and it's bending more than you like, then you might think, and some engineers think, oh, well, I'll just get some high strength steel instead of using this, replace it with a high strength steel beam, and then I'm good. And then you put the high strength steel beam in there and it bends exactly the same amount. That's gonna slide off. Okay, it's good. It will bend exactly the same amount because they have the same amount of stiffness. So even though it can, the high strength steel can handle a higher load, it's not any stiffer. And aluminum and rubber are just some more examples. Aluminum has kind of a interesting mixture. It's a little bit less stiff and a little less strong than steel. And then we've already talked about rubber. All right, we're getting to the fun stuff now. So that was a little bit about design, but let's talk about creating motion here. So there's several different ways that you can get your projects to move. Uh, obviously there's automatic motion, which is mostly what I work with using electric motors and pneumatics. Uh, we will maybe come back to this later, but this is an example of a pneumatic tube. If I wanted to get something to move, then you would hook up your airlines here and with some electrical valves, you could push your load back and forth just by flipping a switch. So maybe we'll come back to this if we have time. I'll leave that there for now. But for DIY projects, you know, you might be looking for manual controls. So maybe perhaps a hand crank or just levers, rollers, whatever. Hydraulics can be kind of messy, but you can get a lot of power. So that's another uh, avenue that's similar to, matic, to pneumatics, but um, typically a little bit more expensive and requires uh, more equipment. All right, let's focus on electric motors here for a moment. Turn that off. All right, I'm gonna try not to use up all my time here because this is <laughs> by far my favorite topic in the world. All right. Two kinds of motors. Let's start with DC. Stepper motors fall under the DC category, although you can buy AC stepper motors. Uh, stepper motors are really good for applications where you need very precise control of the position. These motors don't usually have feedback. In other words, they're kind of blind. You just send a pulse to them and they move forward without sending any information back. So if you overload them, then you can lose your position without knowing it. It's one of the downsides to stepper motors. Um, but what makes them really good is again, their position to their capacity to very precisely control the position of your load. So if you have something that you wanna 
move to two spots back and forth, then you could write a little program, uh, set up your stepper motor, and it can hit those two positions over and over again, as long as you're not overloading the motor. Some of the downsides to stepper motors though, is they don't handle, they don't go very fast. So their speeds are typically very low, like a thousand RPM or less. And uh, again, they don't have any encoder feedback unless you get a special type. So if you overload them, you can lose your position. Permanent magnet DC motors are probably the most widely used motors for small applications, for remote control uh, applications. I'm talking about if you've ever taken apart an RC car, then you've seen one of these little permanent magnet DC motors. But they go all the way up to one to two horsepower. In some cases, you can get them to about three horsepower. But after that, the permanent magnets, you store it you don't have the same economy of scale. You start to lose the efficiency and they usually switch to a different motor type after that. But that gives you a sense of the range. If you're looking for very small motors, you want something that's portable, you can run it with batteries, that's the kind of motor you're looking for. They're usually very responsive to speed control. So they're a good option for projects that where you need to be able to control the speed and you don't need fancy controls for that usually. So that's what makes them uh, a good choice. Brushless DC motors are a relatively new invention in the sense that um, they've kind of exploded on the market. It's not that they haven't been around, but now we see this huge explosion in the last several years of not only these high-end RC cars, but uh, the explosion of drones. Those kinds of applications tend to have these types of motors. So they require a little bit more sophisticated controller, but again, because of the economy of scale, there's so many of these things out on the market you can still get controllers for pretty cheap. Servo motors come in two flavors. There's this little tiny guy that uh, depending upon what you're used to working with, this might be what you think of when you think of a servo motor. But then there's the bigger one, like this one that you see down here in the corner. That is a one horsepower or 750 watt AC servo motor. And it's got a little gearbox on it as well. So this is usually what I'm thinking about when I say servo motor. So if you hear me say servo motor later in the video <laughs> or in this uh, conference, this is probably what I'm talking about. But there's also this little guy as well. Both of them are similar in that they give you very precise control over the position of whatever's connected to it. But obviously there's a huge difference in power output. These uh, usually don't scale up to very large sizes or high speeds. Whereas these, you can get both. You can go both very large as well as very high in speed. All right, breaking down the AC motors. So if you're using an AC motor, your project is probably getting a little larger at this point. We're talking about possibly making your own power tools. At least that's the kind of project I'm usually thinking about when I think of AC motors. And this first one, the single phase induction motor is by far the most widely available one. What makes this guy good is you can usually just plug it into the wall and you got 1,750 RPM or sometimes 3,600 RPM, depending upon which one you get. And so this is a good choice if you need very good speed control, good power, and uh, that guy will give you good torque as well. The universal motor, oh wait, so single phase motors, if you are, uh, you know, scrapping motors and stuff, which is something I often do. Like if I see a treadmill on the side of the road, I might drag that thing home and take the motor out of it. So a treadmill will most likely have a PMDC, permanent magnet DC motor. But sometimes they have these three-phase AC motors in them. It just depends on how new the treadmill is. This is kind of a recent trend. The uh, single-phase induction motor, you will usually find these in washing machines, dryers, at least here in the U.S., in other countries, you might see a universal motor in a washing machine. But so single phase induction motor, it's very common on power tools. So if you have a drill press or table saw, anything like that, it's probably got a single phase induction motor on it. Uh, even your air compressor would have that on it. Three phase AC is also an induction motor, but these are usually found in industrial applications. So these motors can be very large. We're talking about thousands of horsepower. It would be a three-phase AC motor. So very good speed, very good torque. But if you're in an American household, then you're going to need a special controller that's going to take 
the power from the wall and convert it to three phase AC, which is what you would need. Servo motors come in a lot of different flavors. Some of them are DC powered actually, which could be used, which could fall into this category, but still be this type. But most of them are AC synchronous servo motors, kind of a mouthful. <laughs> and these motors are what you find on my robot arm. So all of the joints, all seven or six joints uh, in the freestanding arm are servo motors like the one that you see over here. And oh man, we're doing good on time too. We are almost there people. All right, so sizing a motor, what do you need to do? Now I'm spending a lot of time on this because I feel like if your projects are gonna move, you probably have a motor inside of it. So I thought this was, this was worth investing some time in. All right, how much torque do you need? Uh, I have talked about this in a whole bunch of different videos. And so I decided rather than try to ad lib it here and possibly fumble it, I've got a nice edited version of this discussion from a YouTube video. And this is about a minute and a half maybe. So I'm just gonna play that for you rather than try to explain it live since it'll likely be better. Let's try that. Many of us have experienced the sensation of sitting on a seesaw with someone whose weight doesn't equal ours. Using kids without thinking about it intuitively adjust their position on the seesaw to try to balance out their weight. What you're actually doing is balancing out the torque. The torque is a combination of the force you're applying, in this case, your body weight, multiplied by the length of your lever or the distance to the center of rotation. These two variables are equally important. In this example, you can see we've got twice the weight on one side being balanced out by a lever that's twice as long. Now I want you to think of this pulley as a lever with the length of the lever being the radius of the circle here. The motor has a fixed amount of torque that it can put out. And just like we saw in the example with the seesaw, if you increase the length of the lever on one side, you're gonna to need to decrease the force in order for them to be equal. So using different size pulleys will give you different amounts of force output, but there's an interesting trade-off because the arc length here is much greater on this one. I've given up some force, but I've increased in speed. In fact, they're directly proportional. Putting this one on the motor will give me a lower speed, but more force output. Putting this one on the motor will give me a much higher speed, but a lot less force. Now that we have that foundation, let's take a closer look at the power formula. Here in the US, the horsepower is the customary unit, but I'll be happy to show you watts on the screen here as well, since pretty much everyone else in the world uses that. We're simply multiplying torque times speed and dividing it by a constant. You can also back calculate whatever variables you need. Let's take this motor for example. We have both the horsepower and the speed but we want to figure out how much torque this motor has. We can rearrange this formula a little bit and you can calculate how much torque the motor is producing at that speed. All right. So let's elaborate that on a little, uh, elaborate a little bit on that topic. Uh, here you see an example of me trying to figure out how much power I need to rotate the handle on my table saw. This is a project that I did and there's a YouTube video about this where I fully automated my table saw. I made a touch screen, I wrote a program so that I could type in, okay, I want the fence to go to 40 inches, I want the blade height to be two inches and so on, or I want the blade angle to be 45 degrees. You punch in those numbers, you hit enter, and then all of the various items will move to their right position. And that's what I'm doing here. So essentially what I did is I, I bought a fish scale and that's what you're looking at, hooked it onto the handle, and then started pulling on the handle. Well, the fish scale is gonna read out the force required to move the handle. So that's the first part of my torque formula. And then the second part is the length from the center of this circle out to where the hook is. So if I multiply this length by the force that's written on the screen, now I have my torque. And I know how much torque it takes from the motor to rotate the handle. As all of the math I'm gonna give you in this entire video, measure the torque actually, and you got to put that in another formula. So the next thing you need to know is how fast you want the thing to move. So again, for my table saw, I decided I wanted the handle to spin about twice as fast as if I was spinning it by hand. I picked that completely arbitrarily, uh, just basically deciding that I wanted it to be faster than me, maybe by about two times. And that was all the decision that went into that. But of course, it depends a lot on what you're making, right? As to how fast you want this thing to go. 
But what's interesting about that is once you plug these into your formula and uh, in using horsepower, you're going to divide by 52, 52, and you'll get the units in horsepower. Well, now you know exactly how big a motor to buy. As long as your motor has the right amount of power, then you can use gears to get the right speed and torque ratio. So we'll come back to that idea here in just a minute. But now this is all of the math that you're gonna need in order to figure out how big your motor is gonna be. You can calculate torque by using a simple fish scale and a ruler, and then you can figure out the speed based on whatever performance parameters you need. And once you multiply those two together, you'll figure out how much power you need. And then of course, I've got the little conversion from horsepower to watts for, since everybody else in the world uses watts and we like our customary units here in the US. Uh, I feel pretty comfortable working in both. So uh, you'll hear me kind of intermixing the uh, millimeters and inches and horsepower and so on. All right, so I mentioned gears. Well, I think the best way to think about gears is to just think of them as spinning levers. So this image here is a clock that I built several years ago now, and I used a whole bunch of different combinations of gears, but because mostly I just wanted it to be visually interesting, but I'm bringing this up because I had the full amount of power I needed to move all of these gears, but to keep time, I had to make sure the gears were all moving at the right speeds for their position. I've got a certain set of gears driving an hour hand, and then following that, I've got another set that's driving the minute hand and their ratios need to be correct in order for the clock to read time. And that's all based on the ratios between their sizes, even though I'm using the same amount of power input for the whole system. So I wanna go back to that illustration I gave you earlier, which is this lever. Now, if you consider this to be, think of this as a gearbox. And on the left side, we've got our gear input. And on the right side, we've got our gear output. Essentially, what you're looking at here is the side on the left has to move a greater distance, but with less force. And on the output side, we can move a greater load, but it's going to move a shorter distance, a shorter arc distance. That's the trade-off. Gears are only useful when you have enough power, but the wrong speed. I really want to be careful. I want, I want to make sure I point out that gears do not add power. This is a very common misconception that people have. And I get this email all the time. Like I'll have a system and I say, well, you know, I need it to go faster. And then people will say, oh, well, can't you just use gears to make it go faster? Like, yes, but only if you have more power to make up for the additional speed. So this is why you don't see drag racers with <laughs> drill size motors on the back and just a huge gearbox is because you, it doesn't scale up that way. You have, to add, uh, you have to add more power to increase the speed or increase the torque um, while keeping the other the same. But if the total power output stays the same, then you can increase the speed by giving up torque or you can increase the torque by giving up speed. And that's the trade-off that gears give you. But doing either of those will not give you any more total power. Got it? Good. All right, and uh, oh, I got eight minutes left on the clock. But so I do wanna share one more thing about the pneumatics and that is these guys have a lot of pros and cons, all right? So number one, when it comes to pneumatics, I'm going to... I stopped your slide share to put you full screen so you, you can start it again if you'd like, sorry about that. No, that's good. I was actually, when I saw the pop-up on this side, I, um, I had the same idea, but you were just doing it ahead of me. So that's good. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. So uh, back to pneumatics. Here with pneumatics, you can get very fast motion. So if you need to move something in a straight line, pneumatics will give you very high speed, not as good position control, although there are a lot of options here and more expensive options here in the recent past that have come out but in general, uh, you're not looking for a lot of precision, but you're just looking for one extreme or the other, then pneumatics will get you there. Very high speed, linear motion. And the only thing that you, but you do need other auxiliary equipment. For example, you've got your airlines, you're gonna need a power, um, 
You're going to need your air compressor, uh, filters to get the moisture out, things like that. So it's just something to consider that gears and motors aren't the only way to create motion. You could also use pneumatics. Hydraulics will be very much the same, except you're pumping fluid instead of pumping air uh, or a liquid fluid instead of air. And then I also grab a few gearboxes just to show you that they come in a lot of different form factors. This is called a harmonic drive. This is kind of a high dollar gearbox. Actually, I should have grabbed a cheaper one. <laughs> but uh, these guys give you a huge amount of uh, speed reduction in a very small package. This is a 100 to one gearbox. And look how small that is. It's incredible. This one is 50 to one, but this is a planetary gear. And these are rated for about the same amount of power. So that gives you a sense of how much difference there is in size. But anyway, you don't even really know, you don't need to know the difference between a harmonic drive and a planetary gear. What you need to know is that a harmonic drive will cost more, but they're much smaller and they're more precise. They don't have any backlash. And then planetary gears, uh, these guys will be a little bit cheaper, but you know they're larger. I don't want to say sloppy, but they have just a tiny bit more play in them. So I think I am ready to take some questions. That was an incredible talk. Thank you so much. And we do have uh, some questions from Discord. If you're watching and you want to ask questions, drop into the Discord uh, Remoticon questions channel, and I'll try to, to harvest those. Jeremy, one of the really interesting ones that came up was uh, someone said, I always struggle with understanding static force to get a motor moving versus how much force a motor can provide once it's at speed. What do you think about that? Okay, so uh, certainly there is a difference there, but for the most part, it's not a significant factor. And the reason I say that is because most motor types, pretty much all of them, well, that's not entirely true. <laughs> uh, if you're using the right motor type, and I have a couple of videos on this that I'd refer you to, uh, there's one where I discuss, uh, I can't remember the title right off the top of my head, but in the thumbnail, you see two motors there, like a big one and a small one. And um, I'm just basically comparing the, the pros and cons of each motor type. But uh, if you watch that video, you'll see the ones that fit what I'm about to say. But for the most part, motors have all of their torque when they start. So that means that if the motor is still and then you hit it with power, every, everything that that motor has, and then even above its rate of power is available to push the load forward. So as long as the running load is not too high for the rate of power, then you're usually okay because the starting torque of the motor is usually enough to kind of get the thing pushed off. But, um, if you want to be safe, I mean, like when I'm designing a system, I make sure that the motor is, that the rating of the motor is actually higher than whatever the starting torque requirement is. And um, that way you're way over in the safety margin, but you don't necessarily have to do that. I, when I'm doing my home projects, for example, I don't go through the trouble of that because that raises the cost a lot. You need a much larger, much more powerful motor for a higher load that only lasts for a fraction of a second. It's just that first one second where you've got that big spike that you need a lot of power to get the load moving. But then after that, the motor is just, you know, coasting and, um, and it's easy to handle. So that, that question can get really deep. So I think I'm just going to leave it right there, but hopefully I, I can point you to that video that'll uh, tell you what kind of motor you should be using for those kinds of things. So you talked about dimensioning uh, your materials. You also talked about elasticity and uh, stiffness. But I'm wondering, um, how do you discover new materials? It seems like material science is its whole other thing. And what do you do when you're working on something and you find you've hit a limitation of the material you plan to use? Well, uh, generally what I do is I literally just, uh, there's a website called Make It From. And, uh, well, I don't need to pull it up. But there's a website called Make It From. And there you will see a huge list of materials you can do, put them side by side and see how elastic they are, how strong they are, what their breaking uh, strength is and things like that. And so that would usually be the place that I go. But I would caution you though, instead of making, how do I wanna put this? Uh, 
I would be more concerned about the shape than the strength of the material. Remember earlier in the slide, I said that strength and uh, that shape is just as important as strength. Very often your project fails because you've designed it like this when it should be like this. So if you can always keep that in mind, very often, I mean, you can certainly reach the limit of the material. There are applications where you need something stronger, but I would look at this problem first. Have you designed it shape-wise to be strong enough for the load and put the maximum amount of material in line with the direction of the load before you change the material? Because you can end up spending way more money on buying like this high dollar titanium when just a small change in the shape would have revolutionized your product. And for me, obviously, that's a huge deal, right? Because I'm designing these products for companies and uh, they don't want their product to cost 10 times as much if I could have changed it just a little bit and allowed them to use a cheaper material. So steel is just readily available. It's, uh, in many cases, it's even cheaper than aluminum. So if I can make it out of steel, that's usually a better alternative. And I try to make the shape, uh, I try to optimize the shape before I change the material. Uh, so someone mentioned that high strength steel has the same modulus elasticity. Uh, what kind of strength does it win at? Well, it depends on which one. You can get different grades of steel. And, um, and so you're going to have a different strength at each one. In some cases, you can get uh, grades of steel that are two and three times stronger than the standard steel that you might buy at just your local dealer. But in terms of the modulus of elasticity, that's what I was talking about earlier in the sense that uh, it's just as flexible. So if the point is to make sure that this thing doesn't break, oh, sorry about that. So if you're just concerned about it breaking, then you, uh, it's still making noise. There we go. If you're just concerned about it breaking, then you might switch to a higher grade of steel. But if your structure is too flexible, then it's not the steel, it's the, uh, or it's not the strength of the steel, it's the shape. So I think I answered that question. Hopefully I did. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> uh, another question that came in says, uh, I've always seen pneumatics portrayed as dangerous because it, of the, if the load changes, the actuator can extend instantly. How do you design around that? Okay, um, I guess it, it, there's a lot of factors there. So it kind of depends on why your load would change and what other sort of systems you have in play. Uh, I don't usually think, I don't think of pneumatics as really being dangerous, except the fact that um, because it's a high pressure system, I mean, it, it does move very fast when it moves. So you can mitigate that with a lot of different things. There are dampeners that you can install in your system, which will allow the air to come in or exit out very slowly. So when I was working with Destin at Smarter Every Day on the baseball cannon, uh, we put a dampener behind the receiving end of the cannon. So this is a, I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen it or not, but this baseball cannon fires baseball at supersonic speeds. We're talking about thousands of miles per hour launching a baseball out of the end. And so there's a piston that flies back when the cannon is released because of all the enormous pressure we have to sling that baseball out of there. And we have to catch it, so to speak. So we're using a pneumatic cylinder, but that pneumatic cylinder, when it hits, uh, there's a, a, a valve on the back that just sort of lets the air slowly leak out. And that's, we're using it like a dampener. Uh, in this case, you would do that in reverse. You can make it so that the air coming in is, is dampened. And if your load suddenly shifts, then it can only move at a very slow speed. Uh, there are way more options than that, but that's just the first one that comes to mind. You can, there's all kinds of little gadgets you can hook onto your pneumatics to control the position, control the speed, and do all kinds of stuff with it. Uh, there's an interesting question in here about three-phase motors. The person that's asking it uh, thinks that uh, you use three-phase in your robot arm, uh, but whether you did or not, uh, they're asking if there's a way to, how difficult exp or expensive is it to um, get a converter, or, like bake a converter into the, the uh, design so that you don't need three-phase power always to uh, power the machine? Okay, 
this is a fantastic question. I love this. Uh, I am always building with industrial stuff. So three phase is like a constant challenge for me. And there are two solutions that I have uh, used most often. The first one is you can buy speed controllers that take single phase in and put three phase out. So you are right. All of the motors on my robot arm are three phase servo motors, three phase AC servo. So they require three phase power, but they're not plugged into three phase in my shop. It's just plugged into 240 volts, single phase. And then that comes into one single block that goes out to all of my servo controllers and the controllers themselves actually break out that single phase into three phase. It's well, there's a lot of things happening, but basically it's turning it into DC and then breaking it up and then making it kind of look like three-phase AC. And that's what it's sending out to the motors. So, you know, motors are dumb in that sense. And they just they just kind of move because they think they're getting the right signal and, and they do what they're supposed to do. But so that's one method. The other method would be to get something like a rotary phase converter, which is another option that I have in my shop. But that requires like a capacity bank, capacitor bank, and uh, a three-phase motor. So that three-phase motor will be hooked up to single phase. You have to kick it off somehow, which is something I explain in a video I have. And the video I think is actually titled how to get three-phase from single phase. And um, so, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. In that video, I explained exactly how to do it. But the short version of that story is you're going to need a three-phase motor, a bunch of capacitors, and um, a way to start the motor. And I'll explain all that in that video. So it looks like we have two questions left. Uh, one of them is on motors and another on uh, CAD. So on the, the motors one, um, when you're connecting a motor, do you have approaches that you like to use in your designs for the system to either slip or fail in non-destructive ways? Oh man, I love that question. I got more engineers on this call than I expected, I think. <laughs> Or it sounds like a question an engineer would ask, but okay. So my favorite, by far my favorite method for transmitting power is with belts. And it's for this very reason. Number one, or this is one of the reasons is because if you have a significant overload that can be taken up by the belt breaking and then your system is released. So it can fail safe in that sense. You know, I'm much less concerned about a belt, you know, breaking loose and whipping around. Usually I have belt guards and stuff too, but um, that's much less dangerous than, you know, my motor driving a system hard or destroying an expensive gearbox or things like that. A belt's very cheap to replace. Uh, so it doesn't destroy your whole system. And then, so that's number one. Number two, uh, belts are really cheap and so are pulleys. And um, if you just think about it, it makes sense from a manufacturing standpoint, making a pulley, it can just be cast and duplicated over and over again, where gears are usually machined and they're just much more expensive to make. So they're cheaper, they're easier to align. When you are setting your system up with a gearbox, it's got to be almost perfect. But with belts, I mean, you're supposed to align your belts, but even if it's one degree off, what you end up with is just wearing out the belt faster. Your system will still run. And again, because the belts are cheap, it's not a problem. So belt drive will be my go-to for systems where I want the motor to decouple uh, in case of some kind of catastrophic failure. And, uh, and again, there are other options, but that's by far my favorite. And if you go back through my catalog of videos, you will see that's the most common method that I use throughout my projects for those reasons. Right. And the last one, you made a really interesting point when you were talking about design at the beginning. And I really appreciate it. The, the thought of um, like the, the fastener conundrum, yeah. where you've designed something and you can't then fit the fastener in there. So that kind of makes me think about like design rule checks for uh, electronic CAD. Like, is there some kind of design rule check where you can assign lengths to the fasteners and have your CAD program warn you that you're going to be in trouble? Not that I'm aware of. That's a fantastic question. But, um, you know, I use SolidWorks for 3D modeling, and there are a whole bunch of tools for checking for things like where the parts are interfering, whether you have proper clearances, you can have it checked for tolerances and fits. But 
I'm not aware of an option to check for clearance in the sense of uh, an object being removed or placed manually. So there are even options for if parts are moving, will they hit each other, like collision detection while in motion? You can do that as well. But I'm not aware of anything that would allow you to check for something like that. Uh, to me, you know, it's a combination of experience and prototyping. You know, if you can, well, sometimes it's simple enough where you can just see it's obvious. I won't be able to get my hand in there and get that fastener out, or I can move the fastener back and then it's stuck. I can't get it out or vice versa. I can't get it in after it's fully assembled. So, but while I'm talking about that, I do want to mention that it's easy to trap in both directions. And what I mean by that is you can have it where the fastener can go in at one part of the assembly, but then when it's complete, you can't get it back out. So you do want to think about it in all of its, in all of the different states. Like when I mentioned how you want to make sure that your prototype can actually move and rest in all of the different positions and that it won't tip over or fall, that like moving this like this changes the center of gravity. So that's another thing to think about when you are uh, making things that move is how does the load shift around in all the different positions? So it will probably be helpful to just, for me, what I normally do is I just, you know, think through all the positions it's going to be in. And then I try to check the things that have burned me in the past. Like, oh, you know, I trapped a fastener or I didn't make uh, this opening wide enough to get tools in, things like that. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, first of all, what I need to thank you for is that on your YouTube channels, you are you have spent so much time making sure that you go into the educational background of the thing and not just the building of the thing. And I know I've learned a ton from it and I've heard from a lot of different people who are the same way. So that is awesome. Thank you so much. For